We get to do this review in the shade today because this $500 behemoth of a case is blotting out my sun. So this is a Lian Lee case. It's called the Odyssey X. We first saw it in 2019 and it has finally arrived. It is a massive case comprised entirely, or almost entirely, of aluminum and glass. That means it's expensive. It's also Lian Lee, which means it can get expensive. The best part about this case, much like the O11 Dynamic, of course, is that Roman, aka Der Bauer, worked on it, sort of. He provided a little bit of feedback, but nowhere near the level of input for the O11 Dynamic. So today we're gonna to be reviewing the Lian Lee Odyssey X and talking about that $500 price point. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic and the Liquid Freezer 2 line of liquid coolers, which tested among the best in our thermal charts for CPU coolers. The Arctic Liquid Freezer series has had continual advancements since our original review, with updates in the mounting kit, including an AMD offset bracket for better thermals, and a longer warranty. Arctic also has its MX5 thermal compound, available on the market now if you need some thermal paste for your regular maintenance. Learn more at the links in the description below. So Roman didn't have too much input on this one. Our understanding is that it was more of a standing back and saying, you missed a spot, as opposed to the O11 Dynamic and the O11 Dynamic XL, where Roman, by his own account, or Der Bauer on YouTube, had about 80% of the input for the original O11 Dynamic, and that case turned out very well. This one is very much a Lian Lee design, and it's been a design for a couple of years now. The reason it took so long is because of the complexity of it. Lian Lee says it's a transforming case. Transforming here used lightly. It's not like Inwin's H-Tower where it actually transforms with electronics and controls and things like that. This instead is something you can transform. There's three variations, but really it's just two. There's performance, dynamic, and dynamic R, but one of them is just a halfway step between the other two. And for the most part, you'll probably be using performance. Either way though, we're reviewing all three of the configurations. We'll be talking about build quality, $500 for the price point, which is, you could buy a, a GT 1030 with that money in today's market. To be fair, you could melt this down and get more value out of it than the GT 1030 later, but it's GT 1030 money. Now, the reason this is 500 bucks is pretty simple. The materials are very expensive. It's thick aluminum, it's thick glass. There's a lot of it. It's heavy, so there's a lot of freight and logistics cost involved, and it's going to be low volume. So Lee and Lee doesn't get to dilute the tooling cost across tens of thousands of cases, or the high tens of thousands, like you might with a higher volume case. Instead, the few people who are potentially going to be buying these will be eating the cost of the tooling as well, sort of amortizing it, if you will, against the cost of the development of the case. Enough of the intro though, let's go through the build notes and talk about thermals and noise. Patrick, of course, as always, has a lot of thoughts on the uh, build quality of this case. We'll be going through that and then talking about some of the alternatives, like the O11 Dynamic, the XL, and some other large cases from competitors. Typically, the biggest, most expensive cases we review come with things like RGB controllers, fan controllers, lots of hard drive cages, and a full set of stock fans to add some value. The Odyssey X's stripped down no frills package is closer to the Case Labs approach, but without the blunt functionality or customizable options which justified the Case Labs approach. Also, Case Labs is bankrupt now. That's fine for function focused cases, but the Odyssey wants to be appearance focused, yet offers no controllers or fans to help it. Of course, the coolest part of the Odyssey X is that because the case can be oriented several different ways, Lian Lee simply included their Lian Lee slash their Bauer name tag in the accessory kit rather than pre installing it. This means that we can put it on anything we want, Roman. Our previous encounter with the Odyssey X at Computex 2019 gives us the impression that Roman's involvement was mostly limited to offering feedback on an existing design showed to him by Lian Lee. For the most part, Lian Lee has succeeded at making the components of the case usable in every different configuration. The main exceptions are the separate inner panel that can only be used in the Dynamic R or performance modes, and the four side panel spacers that support the bowed out panels in performance mode. In most other regards, this case truly does transform from one config into another without replacing or adding parts. The Odyssey X is a large case, but it makes use of that size by having standoff locations for full SSI EEB motherboards in all three configurations. EATX boards of any size will overhang the removable motherboard tray, so three extra long standoffs are included to support any board large enough to include an extra row of holes. Radiator support is complicated. We'll summarize by saying that the maximum radiator sizes in each mounting location are frequently mutually exclusive. It's possible to install a 480mm front radiator in performance mode, but this rules out installing a 360mm top radiator. 
In addition, the side mount, available in the dynamic configuration, is completely incompatible with SSI EEB boards and conflicts with some smaller EATX boards as well. This is in contrast to the O11 and the O11 XL, where side mounts remain usable even with large boards. Let's go over the three layouts. Dynamic is the default configuration and the way the case shipped to us, possibly a change from earlier plans to flat pack it. This is a conventional layout with the motherboard oriented normally. The Dynamic R layout is the same as the Dynamic configuration, but with a rotated motherboard tray. The motherboard I.O. faces upwards, and GPU intake fans pull in from the rear of the case. The performance layout is the most dramatically different from the other two. The whole case is rotated 90 degrees from the Dynamic R configuration, so the motherboard orientation is normal again, and spacers are added to the sides of the case, which bow out the tempered glass panels with the hinges in the center. Starting with the Dynamic layout, the side, front, and top fan slots are usable in this one. Unlike the O11 Dynamic with its sealed glass panel, there's no particular reason to use the side fan mounts in the Odyssey X other than to show off RGB fans that aren't included. Some ventilation is available to the side mount through air gaps, but the front and the top mounts are more open for this one. Front fans of any size won't line up with the front panel, so installing RGB fans here will only draw attention to the, we assume, unintentional asymmetry. The two aluminum sections that make up the front panel can be installed like a pair of closed parentheses, leaving a gap in the middle over the fans, or like a pair of opened ones, hiding the front fans from view entirely. We performed our thermal testing later in the closed parentheses style for this one. The panels use toolless snaps at the corners to attach to the chassis, which works fine for a small case, but the heavy glass and aluminum panels are unwieldy when compared to the hinged panels of the C700P or simpler panels of the Meshify 2 family. The toolless nature of the panels is also a lost benefit since thumb screws should be used to ensure the panels remain perfectly flat. They do bend at the center, after all. The metal tabs are of mixed quality. Some have gaps that are too wide. Some are fragile enough that they're a snapping risk if not lifting the panels straight away from the case and carefully, and then a couple of them are actually decent. Cable management is excellent overall with deep built-in tie points that can contain large cables like 24 pin. The tie points are removable but not repositionable, a missed opportunity for Lian Li for its transformable case. And the power supply shroud is a half shroud large enough to contain any cable slack, but open-ended and small enough that it shouldn't be a major obstacle to airflow. The shroud is also removable entirely, but there's no alternative for hiding cables. The rear of the power supply is supported by a rubber block with single-use adhesive strips in the accessory kit. There's another similar block pre-installed in the case, and the blocks must be removed to switch the case configurations, hammering home the idea that nobody is going to use more than one case configuration, despite three being available. Here's the Dynamic R layout. The bottom and front fan slots are available, with rear and side fans largely obstructed by the power supply and the motherboard tray, respectively, although technically, Lanley doesn't mark them as options in the manual. We opted not to test this configuration for thermals. The primary two configurations already required a full case review apiece, and this one is really just a byproduct of the performance layout. It's essentially what you get if you start setting up performance and then you stop halfway through the transformation process. It's an interesting option, but the fact that the motherboard is merely rotated rather than fully inverted, as in other cases we've reviewed, means that the primary intake slots are poorly situated to benefit either the CPU or the GPU when compared to a standard layout. Lian Li has called this a chimney orientation, with the implication being that airflow should go bottom to top, which would put the intake fans at the bottom of the case. In performance mode, the legs are moved to attachment points on the spacers and canted forwards and backwards. The former top panel is moved inside the chassis to act as a cable cover, while the former front panels become the top panel. Front I.O. is detached and moved to the center of the new front panel for this one. The side fan slots aren't usable in the performance configuration. They're not entirely blocked, but they're not positioned in a way that would allow the fans to do anything useful, especially with the name performance. The distinctive bowed out sides of the Odyssey X don't contribute to the case in any meaningful way, other than maybe larger air cooler support, except the Dynamic already supports this. There's increased cable management space, but it's also undesirable since this is all through clear panels that you can see through. There are also 1.2 centimeter gaps that appear with these, but they don't line up with any of the fans. There's potentially space for pumps and reservoirs or vertically mounted GPUs, but there's no built-in mounting hardware. So all of the possible opportunities here were missed. 
The case is approximately 35 and a half centimeters across at its widest point and well beyond the 28 and a half centimeter width of the O11 Dynamic XL. The minimum desk space required for the performance layout is a wide 32 centimeter stance due to the feet spacing and that's with overhang at the desk. Moving the case firmly requires securing the panels with thumb screws up to eight total and blindly installing four of those thumb screws at the bottom of the case is almost impossible and tipping the case on its side or back isn't really a good option. Getting the panels on in this configuration isn't difficult, but it's not the sleek experience offered by other expensive cases we've reviewed, including MSI's embarrassingly bad Secura 500X. It does in fact do something competitively compared to the Odyssey X here. The Odyssey X ships with what seems to be a massive surplus of thumb screws, but every single one of them ends up used in the performance configuration. There are no spares. There are at least extra plastic snaps though, which we appreciate since they're the most likely point of failure. The original front panel of the case is moved to the top of the case here, and just as with the dynamic configuration, there are two styles described in the manual. Only one of the styles actually works, arranging the aluminum panels like closed parentheses allows them to be encircled by the side panels, while arranging them like open parentheses conflicts with the side panels at their corners. Since the new front of the case is where the feet were originally installed, there was some minor scuffing on the Performance Config's front panel, but Lian Li claims that a scratch-resistant protective finish will be applied to the final version. In addition, the two adhesive rubber blocks that were stuck to the inside of this panel left shreds of paper and glue visible through the front of the case, a problem with single-use adhesive in a reconfigurable case. In their location at the new bottom of the case, the two feet are installed over screws which are not countersunk and keep them from fitting flush against the chassis. Typically, removal fan and radiator brackets make it easy to install radiators outside of a case and then stick the whole radiator bracket fan assembly back into the case as a unit. The fan bracket in the Odyssey X, however, doesn't do that. It comes in two parts, the smaller of which can be used as a water pump bracket in other case configs. The fan bracket exists to hide fan screws and to shield fans from I.O. cables. It does not exist to provide any value in installation. It's not easier. It's missing a lot of the key elements that cases much cheaper have. Installing a full length radiator requires lining up the two fan bracket pieces, attaching them to the radiator and fans so that they line up perfectly, putting the whole assembly back into the case and fastening it down with eight thumb screws. Since the front panel is riveted and non-removable in this config, the whole process becomes mandatory. And as a cherry on top, the fan bracket is a perforated grill rather than an empty frame, even though it's protected and hidden from view in every single case configuration. It blocks air, and it potentially creates noisy turbulence for no reason. And now some general info on the case. There are no filters whatsoever included with the Odyssey X. This applies to all configurations. This is a poor choice for such an expensive case, and part of Lian Li's justification may be that the Odyssey X is full of air gaps in every config anyway, and part of it might be that aluminum isn't magnetic. So magnetic filters would require steel strips glued to the case to support. Either way, the result looks about as dustproof as a Cougar Conquer, except it doesn't have any of the easy access for cleaning. Front I.O. is two USB 3.0 Type-A ports, which is good, one USB Type-C port, and two audio jacks. The audio jacks are unlabeled, so it's not clear which is in and which is out without just trial and error. Typically, these would be labeled either by color or by printed text or a stamp in the metal with a headset icon, but this has none of those. So there's not a lot of function for a $500 box. We found at least one typo in the manual where the kale management section on page four had incorrect text in all languages except for English and Chinese, where we saw it was accidentally copied and pasted from the section on page five. This isn't really a remarkable thing overall, but there's also a printed sticker pasted over page 21 to correct another minor mistake. The reason we bring this up is that the Odyssey X is an extremely complex case to assemble both for the factory and for the end user, and slip-ups in the 27-page long manual reflect this. It's also just a small attention to detail thing. Let's get into the thermals for this one. We're gonna keep this a lot shorter than our normal case reviews because this thing's a little different. It doesn't include fans. That means we used our standardized set of Noctua fans for all of the testing. We've done this in the past for cases like the O11 Dynamic XL, and these fans are more powerful than an average mid-tower set of stock fans, 
but they're also the minimum amount of cooling a user might realistically buy for a $500 case. Since the case has no rear exhaust slot in either of the configurations we tested, we installed the two 140mm front intake fans normally and placed the rear exhaust fan at the top of the case immediately behind the CPU cooler. As mentioned earlier, the two removable aluminum front or top panels were installed with the gap at the center for all of the tests. And we're gonna skip a couple like noise normalized and fire strike today and blender, just because we don't need that much data to know what this case is doing. We'll start things off with our usual full system CPU and GPU torture test, focusing on the CPU first. In dynamic mode, with just looking at the Odyssey X on the charts, the CPU averaged 52 degrees Celsius above ambient, which dropped down to 43 degrees with the front panel plates removed. Installing or removing these plates had a huge effect on case ventilation, enough to actually audibly change the pitch of the fans, despite the fact that their only real purpose is to look good uh, and maybe keep fingers out of the fans or something. Moving to performance mode, the CPU averaged 51 degrees above ambient. This is a very small improvement for a configuration named performance especially since the front panel is not removable in this configuration. Performance actually has fewer fan mounting locations than dynamic since the side mounts are unusable. So if the front panel isn't significantly better, there's not much reason to call it that. Comparatively, because the Odyssey X comes with no fans and its relative performance in this test is entirely determined by the fans we selected for it, we'll save most of the comparisons for the standardized fans chart coming up shortly. 51 degrees in performance mode is middling. It's around the performance of a TD500 mesh or a Mesh Phi 2. Both of these cases have less powerful stock fans than the ones we installed in the Odyssey X, but they make up for it with good front panel ventilation. In the same torture test, the GPU averaged 61 degrees Celsius above ambient in dynamic mode, which dropped to 54 degrees with the front panel removed. We usually see less dramatic swings in GPU temperature since our test bench's GPU is still allowed to set its own clocks. So a seven degree delta with the front panel removed is massive. We tried to space the two intake fans to cover as much of the system as possible. So that 61 degree baseline average was measured with a fan pointed directly between the GPU and the PSU shroud. This isn't the most restrictive front panel design we've ever seen, but there's something especially galling about a restrictive panel that's just clipped on for show versus one that's built into the case and has filters in it. Even the ENSO can claim that much, and that case was terrible. In performance mode, the GPU averaged 58 degrees, a more respectable improvement over baseline than we saw with CPU temperatures. And moving on to the fuller chart for GPU, we'll again keep the comparisons brief here. The more favorable average of the Odyssey X entries scored in the performance configuration and is still at the hot end of the chart. It's just below outliers like the BitPhoenix ENSO and the Walmart DTW case at 62 degrees each over ambient. If an air-cooled GPU is installed in the case, we recommend either installing enough intake fans to fill all of the front mounts or experimenting with negative pressure. Since we used our standardized fans for all of the testing, the Odyssey X results for this section are the same as the torture results we just discussed. The comparison, though, is against a different set of data. It's with all of the cases using the same fans. The dynamic mode's 52-degree CPU average beats the O11XL's 54 degree average, but that's primarily because the XL has no front intake slots. So you either have to push off the side panel of the case from a side intake or do what we did and intake from the bottom. The large N2 Pro 2 scored 49 degrees here, better than both the dynamic and performance of the Odyssey X, while the Meshify 2 XL did better at 47 degrees average. We'll use the 58 degree performance config score for comparison on the other GPU temperatures. This still puts the Odyssey X at the hot end of the chart. The N2 Pro 2 and the O11 XL did especially well in this configuration with averages of 45 degrees and 47 degrees each, while the Meshify 2 XL's warmer average of 52 degrees is still significantly better than the Odyssey X. These three fans haven't been inadequate for cooling multiple other large cases that we've reviewed in the past, including the N2 Pro 2, Meshify 2 XL, and O11 XL, and those cases can all be configured to fit SSI EEB boards too. So then for the Odyssey X, the, the oddity of the Odyssey is the three configurations where you're, again, probably only using one of them. It's likely going to be performance and paying this kind of money for a gimmick functionally is always hard to justify. This is not a value purchase by any stretch, but the odd thing is it's also not really a Halo purchase. It's not a top tier marketing product because this doesn't market well. It's not like a, a high end CPU or GPU where people go, I want that. Let me see what else that company makes that's cheaper. 
This instead is probably more likely to turn people away from Lian Li than it is to turn them towards it. And so the better Halo or marketing product for Lian Li to push in front of people has been and still is the O11 Dynamic series. That'd be the O11 Dynamic original, about 130 bucks plus or minus, depending on the, the supply, and the O11 XL. To be clear, we don't think Lian Li is ripping anyone off or gouging anyone at $500 because the price is probably fairly easily justified purely in terms of the bill of materials cost. We don't think they're making high margin on this. It's not like a 3080 Ti where you have infinity margin for basically nothing in return. This instead uh, is something you're, you're paying for the engineering, you're paying for the low quantity, and you're paying for the materials, but you're not really getting that return in most instances, we think. So $500 is not a cash grab, but it's also not worth it as a customer. And that's really what matters here. We've had high praise actually for other cases that do the delicate balancing act of different configurations. The Cooler Master H500M, for example, had swappable mesh or glass front panels, and buyers of the H500M end up forced to pay for all those swappable parts, even if you only ever use one set of them. So Lian Li does get a lot of praise on this one specific category of being reconfigurable, and that is the ability to reconfigure this but use effectively all of the parts in any of the configurations so you don't end up with a cardboard box full of parts that gets shoved in the attic until you sell the thing. So that's good. There's not as much waste of materials for something that most people won't use more, well, really ever. You probably configure it once, that's it. Maybe one more time later in life. But the H500, as the counter example, H500M, uh, you do end up with a box of parts. You end up with drive cages or panels or things of that nature. And so the engineering work here on the Odyssey X is good, but we, we can't justify the price. On top of all of that, two of the three configurations are unexciting. The dynamic configuration makes the case look like a normal mid-tower, but it costs $500 just the same. Lian Li itself makes multiple better mid-towers that are vastly cheaper, have superior performance, and arguably, although this is subjective, look better too. The Dynamic R configuration looks like the Dynamic configuration from the outside, and it functions like the Performance configuration inside. The Performance configuration looks unique enough that some people will love it, but the thermal performance is lackluster in both of the configurations we tested, and the chimney layout of the, the Dynamic R config won't magically change this. That basically leaves us in a position where the only real reason to buy this case is because you specifically like the look of one of the layouts, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, and if you have enough money to pay 500 bucks because you've fallen in love with one of these looks, I, go for it, I guess. The, the build quality is good, and the engineering's good. Uh, and certainly some people are in a position where that's enough, and 500 is justifiable. But by and large, you should buy a different case. For most of you out there watching this, uh, the O11 Dynamic, if you want Lian Li, is a fantastic case and is a strong performer today. The O11 XL, if you want a larger one similar to this, is that larger case. It fits SSI EEB motherboards in full, and you get bonus parts like open loop water cooling accessories you can purchase from first or third party uh, to expand it further. In terms of other options on the market, the Fantax N2 Pro 2 was received pretty well in our review and is also a large case. And we'd also recommend checking out the Fractal Meshify 2 XL. Those cases plus the O11 XL are the ones that would instead get our recommendation in this category. You lose the gimmick, but you get a better case for it, in our opinion anyway. If you're still looking for suggestions after this, we have our best cases of 2021 so far roundup on the channel. That pretty much covers all of the new players in the market and current relevant ones. So check that out if you need advice on things in a variety of price ranges, performance categories, objectives of the case, things like that. Otherwise, as always, you can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up a shirt like this one, our PC shortage shirt, or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. As far as the Odyssey X goes, though, uh, it doesn't get a recommendation. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.